Plus, the fire's going down. Uh, I've been fighting the morning. Stand up here and not say what's on my heart. But I know that without God, that has brought something to my eyes that I need to say. Um, the word over and over and over in my head this morning was the battle. That's all I heard was the battle. Uh, a lot of you all don't know, but my family and kids have been going through a battle. They are struggling with things at school that's going on. Amen. Fighting every day of the world. And they have a battle in front of them every day. And all I can do is pray for them. But these songs this morning have reassured that as long as we trust and obey him, that he will fight our battles for us and get us through. And I know kids are not the only ones that go through these things, but I see it firsthand what they have to go through. And it's hard to watch them struggle, and to watch them overcome the things that they have to. But I want them to have the assurance that they can do this. They don't have to go through and do the things that the world does. They can stand apart and do the right things. And God will fight our battles for us if we allow him. <clears throat> now I'm going to try to sing. <laughs> She's smiling on the outside, but she's hurting on the inside. It's getting hard just living anymore. And the shadow she has clung to, painful things she has been through, have left her feeling worthless, Lord. Changed worthless into precious, guilty to forgiven, hungry into satisfied, empty into full, and all the lies are shattered, and we believe we matter when you change broken into beautiful. Guilty to forgiven, hungry and dissatisfied. Thank you. 
Praise the Lord. Amen, hon. Amen. Amen. I want to praise the Lord for what my heart feels today, for what we've already heard in song and testimony. And uh, I want to say to you kids, if you have a praying mama, a praying daddy, a Christian mom and dad, you ought to get on your face every day before God and give thanks for them. Because you know, you know more so than anyone else here, how volatile, how dangerous the world is out there for young people. And mom and dad, you're their first line of defense. You should be their first line of defense. And it's not always easy to be on the perimeter in the battle, but it's always the right thing for moms and dads to defend their children always in the right way. When kids are wrong, you ought to help them to acknowledge they're wrong. And when they're right, you ought to stand for them. You ought to stand up for them. And it's been suggested that we ask the, all the kids to come into the altar, all of those that are in public education or education, come into the altar at this time. Would you all come in? Would you come in? I, I think probably most old guys my age don't realize the severity uh, of this situation that's out there. But these kids do. They see it every day, as Jessica testified. The battle is every day out there for them. And they got to face it. They got to face it. Now, church, I want you all to come in behind them. Everybody come in behind them. Come on. I know you love these kids. Kids, I want you to move right up to the altar. Move right up to the altar. Come right on up. We're going to pray. As Sherry said, this is a praying church. We believe that prayer changes things. And we need to put all of this in the hands of God and all these children every day in God's hands. All right, let's pray. Somebody just put your hand on them and let's pray over them. the Lord. Just thank the Lord today. God bless. <clears throat> Somebody has a praise for Jesus, you can do that as we go back to our seats. <clears throat> Amen. Amen, Kevin. Amen. Amen. God knows what he's doing, don't he? Amen. Let's give praise to the word and then we're going to preach. This is my Bible. The word of God. Inspired. Infallible. Inerrant, alive, powerful, preserved, sharper than any two-edged sword. Heaven and earth will pass away, 
God's word will never pass away. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I will hide its word in my heart that I may not sin against God. Now give God a big hand clap of praise. Turn in your Bibles to the book of the prophet Isaiah chapter 5. The book of the prophet Isaiah chapter 5. I'm going to read seven verses and preach out of 24 verses, okay? I got two pages of notes front and back, and I'll probably not use any of it. You know how? I'll look at some of them. Isaiah writing to the, to the nation of Israel. He said, I will sing to my beloved, well beloved, a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he, took, he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that there rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment and he looked for judgment but behold oppression for righteousness but behold a cry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the house of God at Duval's Chapel, we bless your holy name. Help us, O God, to preach this message today. Lord, we trust you and you only. Thank you for what already has been accomplished here today. Thank you for these precious young'uns, God, that come forth, Lord, and received, uh, received your spirit, God, in the spirit of prayer. Father, help me to preach, not for fame nor fortune, but to bring you glory and honor and salvation to lost souls. I pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, praise the Lord. <clears throat> I want to preach a message in your hearing I've entitled, God's Sad Song to the Nation. God's Sad Song to the Nation. When I stand here today and think of our beloved nation, I tremble inside as I read chapter or Isaiah chapter 5. Because what I see in Israel through this chapter and through in Judah through this chapter is happening right here in the United States of America. A sad song, God's sad song to the nation. This chapter opens with a song that the prophet was singing from God to the people, his people. There are six woes in this chapter and I'm going to preach those six woes that would come upon the people if they failed to repent, failed to turn back to God. Now, I read somewhere where someone suggested that the reason the prophet sang it in song, presented it in song form, that they had not and would not hear the preaching of the word. Does that not sound like where we're at a lot in our churches today? You can, you can have a gospel singing and have a few groups in and you can't, you can't stir them with a stick. You can have a revival and nobody shows up where the Word of God is being preached. I don't know why he put it in song, uh, song form, but he did. And he sang this song to Israel and to Judah. The monarchy had been divided by this time and things were in 
they were in a lot of trouble, both the northern and the southern kingdom. And so Isaiah, under the inspiration of, uh, of God, and received the word of God, and he began to sing to his well-beloved. To his well-beloved. Now there is no doubt when you study the Old Testament, God loved Israel. God was his spouse to Israel. God is his spouse to Israel. God gave promises and covenants to Israel that are without repentance. God made them a nation, a great nation, with a few people and a small landmass. He made them the apple of his eye. But they went a whoring after other gods and they forgot their God. The vineyard here today is that nation. I want to read this to you again. I want to read a few of these verses again before we attempt to preach this message. He said, My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof. This is how he prepared his nation. His well-beloved was God. His nation was Israel. Israel is the vineyard. He brought her into the land of Canaan, did he not? He said, I'm going to give you this land, a land that you didn't work for. I'm going to give you houses. I'm going to give you uh, uh, vineyards. I'm going to give you cattle. And, and everything that I give you is a gift from God. And say, when you get these things, don't you ever say in your heart, by my own power, my own might, got we these things. And so God prepared them as one a husbandman would prepare a vineyard. And he fenced it so that the enemy could not get in and destroy the vineyard. He gathered the stones thereof. You know, I still see laying around farms where people from decades ago and maybe generations ago would pick the stones up off of the farmland and pile them up so that they could farm the land. And so he said, I picked the stones up. I prepared the ground. I got it ready. I, I gathered the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine, the very, very best seed, the very best vine, and built a tower to defend it in the midst of it. Because why? Because they were a farm country. They were a farmland. And the enemy, all they had to do, Brother Clay, is destroy the farmland, destroy the crops, and you had them. You could starve them out. And so many times when God would judge them, he would just shut the heavens up and everything would die. Everything would die. Look at this. And he planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tire in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth useless ones, wild grapes, grapes that was good for nothing. Why? He said, Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge, I pray you between me and my vineyard. What could I have done more to my vineyard? What could I have done more to cause them to be fruitful and bring forth uh, 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 good grapes that I have not done in there, in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. I want to preach this message. God's sad song to the nation. Skip down with me to the first woe. The first woe. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field till there is no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears said the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitants. The lust for wealth is what he's talking here. If you'll study the nation of Israel, it looks much like our nation today. Or if you study our nation, it looks much like Israel did when God judged Israel. Those that had took away from those that didn't have. Those that, that lusted for wealth and power 
Everything else was cast. Mercy and judgment and goodness and kindness was thrown out the door because everything was about the almighty dollar. Everything was about the almighty dollar. It's everything that this nation lusts after and talks about. All you can think about is the economy. And let me tell you something. Our economy is in shambles. Why? The same reason that Israel's economy became what it was and people were starving is, it, is the same reason that America is in the shape it's in. Inflation is going through the roof, right? Inflation is going through the roof. We have took, uh, we have took from the poor and gave to the rich. I'll tell you one thing COVID did. COVID taught people how to learn to live without working. We say, well, the unemployment is off the chart. More people work, more people are not working today too than ever before. Why? Because the government is taking care of them. They've learned through COVID, you don't have to work to get a check. First thing the government did was give everybody, including Gary Emery, $1,400, wasn't it? You know what we did? We took it to the store and added another $600 on the credit card to it to buy what we wanted, and credit card debt is off the chart, and people are going bankrupt because of it. Why? Why? Because we lust after things that we don't need to keep up with the Joneses that we don't even like. It's the truth. We want, to be like, we want to be like those that have when we don't have. And we'll, we've learned to trust the government. And what the government gives you, the government will control. My daughter, we were together the other day. Her kids are in Christian school. Thank God, thank God, thank God. <clears throat> At Belmont Church, in, it costs money. Actually, it don't. It pays dividends. It pays big dividends. We still pay our school taxes we, just like everybody else. Everybody else. But I want you to get this. She said, I'll be glad when, in something to this effect, that when the government starts giving vouchers so you can send your kids wherever you want to. I'll tell you the rule was when I was at Belmont, we wouldn't take school vouchers because what the government gives you, the government will control. They'll begin to tell you how to educate, what to teach them, what they can't be taught in the, in the Christian school, just like they're doing in New York City today. And I'm going to preach it. God help us. We're trusting the government for our livelihood, even those of us who have jobs many times will trust the government more than we'll trust God. So he said this, Woe, woe to them that buy this farm and that farm and put big blocks of land together to cultivate, to farm, and they weed out all the little farmers and all the houses until there's no need. China's buying up our land, our farm ground. 50, 40, 30 years ago, the Mormon church began to buy up the ground in Illinois, the most, some of the most fertile ground in all of the United States, McLean County. The Mormon church buying it up to control, to control. If you can control what people have to eat, you can control the nation. And just, just look at the reports out there, what China's doing today to America. A China's, China's coming in, buying it up, unbeknownst to most people. But this is what the prophet was saying to Israel. You have put this farm together and that farm together, and the little farmers are being cast by the wayside. The mom and pop farmers are almost no longer into existence, and these conglomerations occupy the farm ground and the devil's going to take control. He already is. And he said, before long, there's no houses. The houses are desolate, even great and fair without habitation. Yea, look at here, verse 10. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homar shall yield one epheth. Look, let me explain this to you, what he's saying. He's saying 10 acres of vineyard will produce 6 gallons of, uh, uh, of juice. Why? 
Because the judgment of God is coming. That's why. Six bushel of seed will yield one half bushel of grain. How could that be? Because God said it would be. What happened to Israel? They began to starve because the judgment of God came upon a nation who had forgotten God. I talked to a friend of mine in Kansas yesterday, a farmer in Kansas. I'll be seeing him here in the next couple of weeks. You know what he told me? He said, Gary, I'm getting five and six bushel to the acre of beans. How much should that ground yield out there? Probably 50 bushel to the acre. He said, I'm in, I'm in corn that is not going to produce 50 acre, 50 bushel to the acre. Why? Why? How much should it produce? Probably 150 bushel to the acre. Now here in Kentucky, it's nothing to yield 200 bushel to the acre in the farm, the prime farm ground. I know I got friends that produce that. So what are you saying, Brother Gary? I'm saying, well, you say this has always happened. Listen, not on the scale that it's happening today. The Mississippi River is drying up. Thousands of barges sitting at the mouth of the Ohio River cannot go down the Mississippi. You say, well, the rains will come back, but all of that commerce that is lost now will never be gained back. And it's at a time when the farmers need to move that grain down the river. You say, well, it'll never happen to America. It is not only going to happen to America, it is happening to America. And we're going to get to the root cause here in just a moment. Look at this, this first woe. The second woe. Woe to them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vow and the tabret and the pipe and the, and the wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. We're a, um, we're a nation that is given over to drunkenness and drugs. We are. Six percent of, of Americans are, are alcoholics today. Six percent of three bill, 300 million people alcoholics today. Our children run a great risk of becoming alcoholics. You know where they'll learn about it? In grade school and middle school. I've talked to them. I know. They hear about it there. I wouldn't even watch, let my kids watch the commercials on television, but as soon as they got on the school bus and got to school, they started hearing it from their buddies. Are you upset with the public school system? If you haven't learned it by now, I want you to know it's an emphatic yes. Thank God for you Christian teachers that are there. You're on the front line of this battle. You see what's going on. You don't have to like it even though it's the hand that feeds you. You don't have to like it. You don't have to like it. Drunkenness. Woe to them that are given over to drunkenness. And now we got them in the pews of our church. Perhaps some of you that believe it's all right to sip a little wine of the evening with your meal. Number one, it's going to destroy your testimony. It will with me. It will with me. Never should wine cross the lips of a Christian. No alcohol should cross the lips of a Christian. You are not your own anymore. I could read it to you right out of the Word of God. I think we even maybe sing about it today. You've been bought with a price. You belong to God. You're the friend of God. God is your friend. You're the, the, the angel armies are by your side. Well, Brother Gary, what about Luke chapter 2 or 3 and the, where Jesus turned water into wine? Let me tell you something. I am, I, in my flesh, there is no good thing. I am corrupt. And without the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ, I am lost forever. Nothing good about me. So if I would never give a drink to a person, you can never make me believe that the, the Lord of hosts, the only one righteous, the only one good, the only one true, would give alcohol to a group there, and some of them were bordering on alcoholics already, if not already alcoholics. It don't make sense. It don't make sense because it's not true that God gave wine to that group of people. If a lost sinner like me without grace 
wouldn't give wine or alcohol to an individual, what makes you think Jesus would? He didn't. He didn't. Now watch this. Woe to them. Partying. The music. The music they listen to these days. Even in the church houses. Young people go to concerts. And they're more like rock and heavy metal and acid and all that stuff that used to be than they are gospel music. I know. Our kids at Belmont goes and went. Brother Woody would get them up when certain groups came on and they'd go back to the motel and have Bible study. We changed. We're accepting things that should be off limits. And things that are off limits to the Christian should be a part of their life. Woe. Woe to the drunkards. Woe to the, to the drug addicts. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll believe C. Ever Coop, former Surgeon General, that said alcohol should be a class 2 na- narcotic. It's a gateway to other things. My father-in-law that's gone on to be with Jesus always said that if a person will drink they'll do anything and there's a lot of truth to that once you get to a point you lose all reasoning and control alcohol nothing good about it why do you keep preaching it because of these kids that came to the altar they're faced with it they got to say no they got to try to spin out of it when they're buddies and they don't want to be embarrassed and the peer pressure's there and they want to be like everybody else, but you don't have to be like everybody else. Stand and be different. Say no to alcohol. I did. I did all of my younger days. I did until I was 18, 19 years old. I said no to it. You, with, as a lost person, I said no to it. And you can too, by the grace and the love of God. Don't ever take the first drink. You won't ever have to quit. It'll make a fool out of you. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Wine is a mockery. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Alcohol will destroy marriages, leave scars on children throughout the remainder of their life, dissolve dissolve homes, bankrupt society. It's done it. I fought it in the public system up in Butler County. Thank God, God was with us in it. There's nothing good that comes out of it. I've told you the stories. They still, I can close my eyes and in the theater of my mind, I can see the faces of mamas and the tears and the heartache and the pain and the sorrow that goes along with alcohol and a good night on the town. Alcohol. Did I tell you I hate it? I hate it. There's nothing good that comes out of it. I'll tell you something I hate even worse is is church members that think it's okay to use the junk. And the larger churches many times are those that attract the people that believe that it's okay. We got them up home. I know people that go to them. They go to them because they want a social drink. I know. Some of them are my friends. Some of them may even be my family. The third woe. I wish I had more time to preach on alcohol. The third woe. Verse 18 and 19. Woe to them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were a cart rope. That say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come and we may know it. They're drawing, it's like a a beast. They become a beast of labor to their own sin. They're pulling the cart of sin and iniquity with these cart ropes. Sin has become a burden, a grievous burden upon them, but they can't let it go. And they'll say, well, if God's so good, why don't He come and take it away? Why don't He change America? Why don't He he bless America? God will never bless America in the shape it's in. 
He will never bless America again, I should say, as he has in the past because of the sin that we've allowed to come in. It didn't just creep in. It come in like a roaring storm into our society. And in the past two, three years or so, it has spread itself like a green bay tree. Woe to them that draw iniquity and with cords of vanity and sin as it were a, with a, a cart rope. And now they're saying, God, if you're so big, if you're so good, if you're, you, you take care of it. You, you, you come and, and show us your power. Show us what you can do. I remember back in the 60s and 70s, there was this, this, this fool called... Uh, Madeline Mary O'Hara. She was the queen of atheism. She was the president of the National Atheist Organization. She had two children. Actually, she had one child and a, and a grandchild, if I remember right. They would run that boy out of schools because she was the most hated woman. Time magazine came out on the cover of the, the a magazine with her picture, the most hated woman in the United States. The country hated her. They, she cursed God. She blasphemed God. She'd get on talk shows and, and blaspheme God. And she'd appear many times and it was more a show for, for notoriety than anything else with a fellow called the Bourbon Street Evangelist. I used to know his name. I can't call it, recall it right now. But he would preach up and down the streets of uh, Bourbon Street in New Orleans, Louisiana. And, and uh, Harrington, I believe was his name. Bob Harrington, I believe it was. And he would come on Donahue's show with this atheist. And they would debate atheism plus theology, uh, Christianity, the Bible. And I remember she'd take a stopwatch. And she'd set that stopwatch for a minute. And God, you got one minute to strike me dead. I, I, I'm sitting there thinking, God, why don't you just strike? Where are you at, God? Where are you at? But God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. Your God has got one minute to strike me dead. Right here on there, if there is a God, let him strike me dead. That's what these ungodly people in Israel were saying. If there's God, God, if you're still out there somewhere... Why don't you come? Why don't you come and reveal yourself? Don't just send your prophets, your old slobbering preachers into the pulpit. God, you come. Show up. God will show up one day. And he's showing up now if we'd get the blinders off of our eyes. Our nation is going to hell, folks. It's not about the money anymore. It's not about prosperity anymore. It's about the salvation of this country. It's about our souls. It's about our children. It's about our prosperity. It's about those who will come behind us. We're in trouble. Well, it, it'll get better. It's not going to get better, guys. Oh, the pendulum might swing back a little bit, but it'll never get to where it was when I was a child. It'll never get to where it was when Brother Gary got saved. It'll never get to where it was with many of you that are younger than me, where it was when you was a young person. The third woe. The third woe. Did you know the New York City, Mayor Eric Adams, defending, defended sending drag queens to the public schools and libraries. You know what a drag queen is? This is where we're at, guys. It's a slang word for homosexuals and mostly men that dress up like women and they look like devils. And they parade and dance and they take their children with them many times. New York City spent $200,000 to pay these people to go in to the, to the schools and libraries to perform and read to our children. What age? Grade school, or elementary school, middle school, and high school.
You can't make this stuff up. God knew it was coming. God already saw it before. Drag queens. Go home. Google it. Go home and Google it. If you've never seen a drag queen and you're an adult, you ought to, you ought to look at one at least once in your life. Who's the devil targeting? He's not targeting so much this old preacher, and he wants me too. He wants your kids. He wants the next generation. Since January, 49 drag programs in 34 public elementary, middle, and high schools in New York City has cost $200,000 of the taxpayer's money. Little first and second graders are being taught that they might be girls when they're boys or they might be boys when they're girls. And, oh, and you better not be a tomboy these days. You better not be a tomboy because somebody's going to try to talk you into being a, a boy. Well, really, you are supposed to be a boy and you're a girl. Sad. It's a sad song that God is singing here. Look at the fourth woe. Verse 20. The fourth woe. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet. Does that not sound like America? Does it not sound like America? It does sound like America. And it's sad. Moral standards were destroyed in Israel. And have been destroyed in the United States of America. By do, new, it's destroyed by new definitions of sin. We have changed terminology and definitions until nothing's wrong anymore. Wrong anymore. Today, so-called Christians use God's vocabulary but not His dictionary. Politicians... Preachers, with this kind of language, make it easy to deceive people and avoid a guilty conscience. When's the last time anybody's had a guilty conscience over anything? When's the last time, Jeremiah asked, have you blushed? Have you been embarrassed about something? Because everything is so accepted, so accepted. Evil, good, good, evil. Black, white, white, black. You say it enough, people will believe it. That's what Hitler's henchmen said. Nothing is so absurd that on what, if you say it enough, people will believe it. They tell us the economy is great. That $5 diesel fuel is okay. It's okay. They don't have to fill up my tank very often. These guys that, that, that push this agenda has got enough money to burn two wet mules. You go into Washington, Republican or Democrat, worth about 300000 you come out worth millions. Something's wrong, isn't it? And we've got the best politicians money can buy. We really have. You can't get voted in on a few, few measly million dollars. That's all they talk about. He raised... Fifty million dollars in just a little while. How we can't beat that bunch. They got too much money. I'm gonna tell you something. And I, I'm not a campaign. I'm telling you this on the authority of God's word, what I'm preaching here today. Israel lived it. You know what happened? I know the history. A little while down the road, this bunch didn't repent. This nation did not repent. The Assyrians, Sennacherim, that bunch came. Destroyed them, 722 B.C. 722 years before Christ, they were destroyed, carried away into Assyrian captivity. Their nation fell. Then Judah lasted. Judah survived because of, they had a few good kings along the way. Nine good kings is all Judah had. 100 years later, 605 B.C., the Babylonians came and destroyed them. It's not a question on if our nation will fall. It's just when it will. It's when it will. A military, they can't get people to go to the military to defend the nation. Can't get them, to, can't. It's at the lowest ebb ever. 
we have depleted our, 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 our forces until it is believed, it's reported that we wouldn't be able to fight one battlefront, one war front, let alone multiple ones. We live in a time of breathing out threatening and spoil. Putin is, is ravishing uh, your, the your Ukraine and they've put up enough fight over there that he's lost much of his military and his people. He's threatening nuclear bombs and threatening NATO to stay out of it. I know I was alive when John Kennedy backed him down. Khrushchev, he backed him down, didn't he? You say, well, I thought you was a Republican. I'm for anybody that loves our nation and that will love the Constitution and stand up on the Constitution. But that bunch that is in Washington now, they'd be better off to go to a third world country because that's what they're trying to make this one to be. Why? So they can stay in power. So they can stay in power. What are you going to do? I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote. But I'm going to vote Jesus. First of all, I'm going to vote for Jesus. No politician I can help put in office is going to take care of these issues. Oh, they may put a band-aid on them for a while, but I'm telling you it's gone too far this way or that way till it's not going to swing back and they have to compromise to stay in power once they get in there. And they will. Woe. Look at the next woe. That was 20, right? Verse 20. The fifth woe. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Wise in their own eyes, prudent in their own sight. Instead of listening to God, Instead of believing the Bible as our founders did, and not all of them were Christians, but all of them knew that there was a supernatural power out there that was in control. But many of them were Christians. They consult with one another. They get all their experts together, and then sometimes they don't even listen to them. They make decisions based upon their own wisdom, professing themselves to be wise, They become fools, Romans says, chapter 1. They become fools. Every time I listen to them, I listen to a bunch of fools. I really do. And I know, I'm not educated, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I know a little bit about the Bible, and I know a little bit about what God wants for our country. And it's not what they're producing in Washington. And I can understand the person that goes to Washington that really wants to do right, how helpless they must feel. Just like you guys that's in the, in the school systems. You must feel helpless sometimes. Sure, you can teach. You're good at what you do. You can teach reading, writing, arithmetic, and whatever else you're supposed to be teaching. But we're giving more time to the woke agenda God help. And if I don't don't say it, ain't nobody else going to say it. That administrator at the school is not going to teach it. He can't. She can't. I understand that. But Isaiah could. He told them, we can look back in retrospect and see that everything he said was true and it come to pass. God took away the vineyard. He took away. The vineyard was Israel. And he took them away. He destroyed. He judged them. They're fools. Fools. I can tell you what. They can produce all the green energy that they want to. And it will not, it will not stop the judgment of God coming upon this planet for one second. And they say that's why they're producing green energy is to save the planet, right? They better be crying to God for their souls to be saved. Because this planet is going to be judged along with the rest of the world. And guys, I want to say again, please don't get mad at me if you're in public education. 
but I got to preach what I got to preach what the God puts on my heart in the scriptures. And I'm, it breaks my heart to see what our kids have to put up with. And I know you guys don't like it. I know you don't. I know you don't. The sixth woe. Look at the sixth woe. This is a good one. If there could be a good one. Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine. There it is again. I believe God hates that fermented juice, don't you? And men of strength to mingle strong wine, strong drink which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. We have had we have had 192 let me see here I'm sorry according to the National Federation of the Order of Police from up until September the 30th, there have been 252 police officers shot in the line of duty. 50 of them are dead. They never went home to their wives and their children. You don't hear much about that on the world news, on ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, and all the rest of, of them out there. What you do hear is a George Floyd that a memorial was built to, an accused and convicted drug dealer, and he should have never died the way that he died. But to memorialize him and then cry, defund the police, which is causing a lot of this to take place. What kind of people are we? And let me tell you something. If any of you get in trouble, you're going to call the police, aren't you? If somebody tries to break in your door and they're loaded with an AK-47 or an AR-15 or a pump shotgun, you expect that policeman to come out and put his life on the line and protect you. And that's true. That's why they're there. But we ought to love God enough that is a God of civil control and to honor them. I'm tired of it, guys. I want you to know because I see what's coming. I see what's coming. Our nation is in trouble. We have the sins... Of, of politicians, liberal district attorneys, and news media, and, and the educational system of this nation. It may not be serious to our society, but it's serious to God. And He's going to judge, guys. Look at what, it, what He said. L- let, me, let me go on here. Boston, Massachusetts. The Boston Globe gave a report. Since COVID, 21 first-degree murders have been released in Massachusetts from prison. 21. Life sentences. Was never to be out again to kill somebody else. Somebody's daddy, somebody's son, somebody's daughter. But because of the technicality of a law, COVID came and they had to set them free because... These 21 got COVID and they might die in pre- and the law didn't work the way really the legislators probably wanted it to. But this is what God is saying. We justify the wicked and the righteous we make criminals out of. Right? Canada, you can't mention the name homosexual or lesbian from a pulpit. It's a, it's a crime. It's, a, it's the law of the land. And it's going to be that way here before long. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossoms shall go up as dust. Because they have cast away... Here's why. They have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. 
far we're in, the shape we're in, we've forgotten God, guys. Duval's Chapel has it. There's little churches scattered around across America that still preach the truth and stand on truth that despise what's going on out there, even in some churches. But because we have forgotten God, this has come. It's not. Uh, they may use the Democrats. Satan might in a greater way than Republicans or the Republicans. But it's coming right from the devil. God is allowing the devil into our nation. You hardly ever hear of anybody being saved anymore. Thank God Benjamin got saved here the other day, didn't he? Huh? But you hardly ever hear it because there's no conviction. Everything's okay. Nothing's wrong anymore. It's not preached. It's not taught. It may be here, but they don't hear it anywhere else. You're supposed to get a here a little, there a little. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. And if you don't like how Brother Gary preaches, you can just go down to the next church and they'll just welcome you right in and preach to tickle your ears. There was a lady committing adultery at the church years ago. I went to her home, called her out on it, asked her about it. And... Uh, she left Belmont along with whoever because the Baptist church down the road, the deacon said, you can come down here and sit on the front row with me. And that's fine. That's fine. That's their church for it. But that's what we're up against. That's what we're up against, guys. It's like mama said, don't do it. And you go over to daddy and he said, ah, it's okay. Don't pay no attention to what mama says. How are you going to raise kids like that? How can you do it? You can't. We've got to be of one mind, one accord, and stand together. Churches should. They used to. But it's not so anymore. And judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. He said you're like flowers with short roots, and you're just going to burn up like dust. You're like straw or hay, uh, wheat with short roots, and the, and the sun pops out, and you just burn up. That's how shallow we are as a nation when it comes to the Word of God and the spirit of holiness. Drag queens get more attention than, uh, than the preachers and the Christians these days. Certainly get a whole lot more money, don't they? Amen. Let's sing. Let's get a song. Let's stand. You're here today and you need prayer. If nothing else, pray for Brother Emery. I used up a lot of political clout this morning, didn't I? Give God, give God a hand clap of praise. Give God a hand clap of praise. That's right. Sing real pretty, Hannah. We need it now. Someone need to pray, just come right on.
Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. 